Hey everyone, welcome to part 2 of my expose on Halo's aim. In today's part, we're going to be further elaborating on controller input, controller settings, and how Halo Infinite changes things up compared to the games of the MCC. Part 1 of this series was about aim assist, or more specifically, what the game does once it's already gotten your controller input. In this part, we're going to be discussing how the game gets your controller input, what all of Halo Infinite's settings mean, and how Halo Infinite changes things compared to the games of the MCC. In a moment, I'm going to be using hand-drawn graphs and diagrams to give you a PhD-level understanding of controller settings in Halo Infinite. Once you come away from this video, you'll have a comprehensive understanding of controller settings and how to set the controls in Halo Infinite. You'll also understand why Halo Infinite falls short of the MCC, and why there are numerous design flaws in Halo Infinite's input settings that prevent this game from fully feeling like the MCC. We're going to be referencing quite a bit of information that I covered in the first part of this series, so if you've not seen that, I would go check that out first, and then return to this video. To begin, you need to understand comprehensively every single setting that Halo Infinite gives you. Consider this a dedicated explainer video that goes in-depth to developer-level knowledge on controller input. I designed here a graphic to represent all of the settings in Halo Infinite. Here on the right, we have a cross-section of a joystick, and on the left, we have a line graph that I'm going to be using to sketch some curves to represent Halo Infinite sensitivity. Down here, you can read at your discretion, is a brief description of every setting in Halo Infinite. If you already know what the settings in Halo Infinite does, and you're familiar with the concept of response curves and acceleration, feel free to skip to the time post on the video right now. But to begin, we're going to be getting with the inner dead zone because it's the first thing most players will encounter. It's very simple, it's basically just a center in the middle, a radius within which all input is ignored. And the reason developers do this is to help combat stick drift. Now, stick drift is inherent to pretty much every single controller, and it only gets worse as controllers age, degrade, or dirty with time. Controllers are me mechanically imperfect, so in order to combat this issue, developers program a dead zone within which any residual input from the controller is ignored. It's only once we move our thumbstick past the dead zone do we start to notice any response from the game. It's basically a way of programming a predetermined point on the thumbstick and that becomes your new zero. In this instance, we're going to be working with an example of five. Now, the rule out there for pretty much every video game is to go with the minimum viable dead zone that your controller will tolerate, and having the ability to customize these in Infinite is a pretty welcome change. However, because adhesion, or some form of aim assist in Halo Infinite, is so sharp, removing your dead zones entirely allows you to cheese the game's aim assist into activating suitor, more frequently, and more often. Basically, stick drift is good in Halo Infinite. It's only once we move our thumbstick past our dead zone, which in this case is 5, do we notice any response from the game. And as we move our thumbstick further and further to the edge, we start to notice more and more velocity. So I'll briefly sketch Halo Infinite's curve, or an approximation of it, here. This is not to scale, in fact it's woefully underscale, you'll see in a minute later in the video, but as you can see, the area under the curve represents our our turn speed. The more area we have under the curve, the faster we move. Now, raising your sensitivity allows you to change the maximum value that our curve terminates at. So if we were to raise our sensitivity, the shape of the curve would stay the same, but we see it start to deviate. Allow me to draw that again, because the general geometry, the slope, or the general shape of the curve stays the same. They are similar, but they're not congruous. You see, as we raise our sensitivity, there is more area under this curve, which corresponds to a higher turn speed. This is how raising your sensitivity affects the response from the video game. Now, I forgot to mention that for the inner dead zone, max input threshold, and axial dead zones, their scales, their sliders, correlate roughly into percentage values. So an inner dead zone of 5 means 5% 5 of the total radius or distance to our edge, the edge of our thumbstick. Next up is our max input threshold. Very simply, it is a threshold past which we've hit our maximum input. It is essentially the inverse of an inner dead zone, where in this instance we're going to be using a max input threshold as 90 for this example, which correlates to 10 in-game. Basically, 
it programs the game to treat every input past 90 as 100. Again, it's basically a way to shrink your thumbstick, the outer radius of your thumbstick. That way it registers as smaller than it actually is. And the reason that we utilize max input thresholds is pretty much solely for the purposes of acceleration. Now, what is acceleration? Very simply, game developers understand that slow, accurate, and precise aiming and agile and fast turning are diametrically opposed goals. You cannot aim accurately with a fast sensitivity when your reticle is moving very quickly. That's for turning. So in order to reconcile these goals, what developers do is induce acceleration to the end of the thumbstick. And what this does is once you hit this point, spoiler, it's your max input threshold, the game will apply a multiplier to rapidly scale your sensitivity or your turn speed up to your maximum value. It is important to note that your acceleration value does not determine what your maximum sensitivity is, only how quickly you reach it. Now, acceleration curve, it's actually a discrete curve from your normal response curve, and that is to say that it is applied over it, it overrides it. Now, your max input threshold and acceleration are heavily linked because literally the only thing that max input threshold does is determine the point at which this response curve, the acceleration curve, will bisect it. So, since in this example we're working with a max input threshold of 90 or 10 in game value, what that means is that our acceleration curve which is a very steep, almost 90 degrees like curve line, it's a line segment, all that means is that it bisects our curve at our max input threshold. And I've used a different color to denote this fact. It's a different curve. And here is our acceleration curve. Now it's important to note, this is very critical, thumbstick placement is irrelevant for the purpose of acceleration. Once you peg or hit your max input threshold, what you do past this point is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you do with your thumbstick while acceleration is being applied. It is only a factor of time and sensitivity. A lot of FPS players understand that if you lower your acceleration value, because acceleration is delayed and taking longer to take effect, it, this gives the illusion of a more smooth and consistent turn speed because acceleration doesn't immediately kick in. What this is actually doing, what's really happening here, is that acceleration is just taking longer to take effect. They're not actually controlling the game with the thumbstick. This deludes players into thinking they have more smooth and consistent control over their aiming, when in reality, acceleration is just taking effect a lot much slower. It doesn't matter what you do with your thumbstick once acceleration is being applied. It's just making the game take longer to reach your maximum sensitivity. In my opinion, higher acceleration values are good, especially in cross-platform games, because they allow controller users to turn quickly. There's one more misconception most people have about acceleration, and that is acceleration has no effect on the response curve until you reach your max input threshold. Some people believe that acceleration is consistent throughout the entire thumbstick, that the longer you hold the thumbstick down, the further you go. No, that's not true until you hit your max input threshold. You will, If you move your thumbstick to a given point on your thumbstick, you're just going to move at a constant velocity that doesn't change. Now the final controller setting that we're going to explain is axial dead zone, and if we draw our attention to the graph on the right, the bars in yellow are our axial dead zones and what they do is provide a tolerance for deviation toward the cardinal direction you have four of them and what that means is as you move your thumbstick along the cardinal directions you will move absolute left right up or down basically if you consider my mouse my thumbstick and i move toward the east and i make all of these little mistakes these little deviations they will be ignored. They will still count as absolute east. It is only once I leave the axial dead zone will the game actually register the change. Now, higher values expand the width of these dead zones. And voila, that is every single setting that Halo Infinite gives you access to, though it should be noted that naturally, sensitivity and acceleration are exclusive to the look stick.
So now that you understand all of the controller settings and exactly how they do and what they do, how do you get Halo Infinite controlling like the MCC? Well, why don't I just go into assembly and get those stats directly from the engine for you? Now I'm going to be giving you the values for the PC version of the MCC and I'm going to assume it's the same on console. Now it's important to note that these values may have actually changed since their original 360 releases to accommodate more advanced and sophisticated controller designs. Furthermore, the original settings are in different units. They use a decimal system where 0 is the minimum and 1 is the maximum. Lastly, the original games substitute the term max input threshold for pegged threshold. These are the same thing. Here we go. Halo Reach had an inner dead zone of 0 0.125, an axial dead zone of 0 0.125 as well, and a pegged threshold or max input threshold of 0 0.95. Halo 4 used the exact same settings. Now I rummaged around to try and find Halo 3 settings, but I was only able to find the pegged threshold and it's the same as Halo Reach and Halo 4. However, I can tell you that Halo 3 had much higher axial dead zones than Reach and 4. It might actually be the case that Halo Infinite doesn't allow you to set your axial dead zones as high as Halo 3 originally had them. As I said, the legacy games use a different measurement system. They use decimals instead of the linear, what is implied to be percentage values, of Halo Infinite. So here are the conversions on screen now. And now that you have MCC's figures, you can now calibrate Halo Infinite to have similar settings. I sincerely hope you enjoy playing Halo Infinite with settings that mirror those of your favorite Halo title. I'm Critical Infinite, and I'll see you in the next... Waity... What do you mean it doesn't feel like MCC? Of course it doesn't. I told you in the very beginning of this video that wasn't possible. Okay, let me explain. People flock to these types of videos because they want their aim to be as accurate and true as it is in the MCC, but what they discount is that MCC gives you every single setting except max input threshold. The same things you can do in Infinite, you can do in MCC. There is a reason the two games still remain disparate. There are a lot of people on the internet right now telling you that they have the best settings and that if you just raise your max input threshold to a given number, you're automatically going to unlock the powers of Master Chief in the books and become an aim god and never miss. That's not true. The reality is that the settings menu in most video games, but most especially Halo Infinite, have a very, very small, perhaps even negligible impact on your ability to aim. And here is the fundamental difference between Halo Infinite and MCC, at least when it comes to controller. Come back to our approximation of Halo Infinite's response curve. Do you notice how flat it is? How you really need to move your thumbstick really far to the edge before the game gives you any significant velocity. And even once you peg past your max input threshold, the game really doesn't do anything until acceleration kicks in. There is an uproar in the community right now that Halo Infinite needs a higher sensitivity, that we need to move it to 15, 20, 30, but what most people don't actually realize is that Halo Infinite has the same maximum turn speed as Halo Reach. The real issue at hand is the geometry or the shape of our response curve. It doesn't get fast soon enough. It takes too long before Halo Infinite gives you a significant amount of velocity that is suitable for aiming and turning. There is no way to take Halo Infinite's response curve from this to this, or this, or this. No, instead you are stuck with this lazy, flat curve that takes way too long to get fast. It's not that Halo Infinite is slow, it's that it takes too long to get fast. The issue is the response curve. What if I told you Halo Infinite has the same response curve as Halo 3? Okay, now we can finally move away from the crude drawn charts and graphs. On screen right now is the actual Halo Infinite response curve. This isn't my work, but the original creator opted not to be cited. It was obtained by using a Titan 2 console tuner to measure the output on screen with the input of the controller. Basically, it was obtained by using precise instrumentation. This is it. This is the Halo Infinite response curve. Now, here's the Halo Infinite response curve side by side with the Halo 3 response curve. It's virtually identical. So, if Halo Infinite has the same response curve as Halo 3, then why doesn't Halo Infinite feel like Halo 3? 
Well, remember earlier I mentioned how Halo Infinite has the same maximum sensitivity as Halo Reach? Halo Reach, Halo 4, and Halo Infinite all have the same max turn speed of 360 degrees per second. That's the scale. However, Halo 3 goes significantly beyond this, almost twice that of Halo Reach, around 650 degrees per second, which means effectively the Halo Infinite curve is being compressed despite the fact that it is geometrically proportional to Halo 3. If we look at the response curves of Halo Reach and Halo 4, we see that the y-axis takes a fundamentally different scale. They are not directly comparable one to one. Halo Reach effectively takes half the sensitivity of Halo 3. Because these games control at roughly half the scale of Halo 3, their curves are commensurately aggressive. They have been adjusted to reflect the shortened y-axis. Halo Infinite doesn't do this. It takes the response curve of Halo 3 and uses it with the scale of Halo Reach. It's the worst of both worlds. If we take the data points and plot them on an absolute scale, that way the sensitivity of each game can be directly compared, this is what we get. Here is what Halo Infinite looks like next to the games of the MCC. Each curve is proportional to the same y-axis. The curves are directly comparable. Look at Halo Infinite, all the way on the bottom. Ooh, that's kind of small. Yikes. The issue isn't strictly the sensitivity options that 343 makes available. Earlier on in the thumbstick movement, maybe up to 40% of the way, things actually feel pretty good. It's only once you start moving your thumbstick into the latter half of the radius do things start to feel stiff because the game isn't giving you enough velocity. Like I said, Halo Infinite has the same maximum rotation speed as Halo Reach and Halo 4. I don't remember anyone complaining significantly about that. It's just that Halo Infinite takes too long to get there. 15 sensitivity, 20 sensitivity may or may not reduce the issue of slow turn in Halo Infinite. It depends on the player's preferences, but what it won't solve is the delay of Halo Infinite's response curve. What many players feel, myself included, is that the response curve of Halo Infinite isn't varied enough. It starts off slow and gets progressively faster, but it doesn't get progressively faster enough. The issue isn't just the slow sensitivity, it's the lack of variance in the response curve. So now that you understand why the settings menu isn't capable of making Halo Infinite feel like the Master Chief Collection, the question must be asked, why would 343 do this? Well, we know from my previous video that the reticle friction field, or the magnetism degree, or range, has been reduced in Halo Infinite on precision weapons. In previous games, you are more welcome to an aggressive response curve because the game's aim assist would dynamically scale your sensitivity with respect to your target. You were allowed to turn so quickly because the developers understood that when it came time to make precise adjustments to your aim, aim assist would come to help you with that. In Halo Infinite, because the magnetism angle or the reticle friction field of targets has been so dramatically reduced, the game now needs to be precise all the time. It's like having reticle friction that never turns off. The whole point of reticle friction or magnetism is to allow controllers to dynamically control their sensitivity. It's contextual, it automatically occurs near targets. Halo Infinite has a sluggish response curve because the aim assist is downright austere. The fact of the matter is, dead zones and thresholds are more about calibrating the game to your controller than actually customizing your preferences. Don't get me wrong, you can make the game feel really weird by putting the wrong settings into this menu, but when it comes to improving your aim, it really doesn't help you that much. Please understand that I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but when somebody tells you that they have the definitive settings to use, that these settings are the best, those are the settings that work best for their controller, and every controller is different. Even two controllers of the same make and model can vary wildly in the location of origin, how sweaty the worker was when they made it, how old it is. No two controllers are the same, especially when it comes to the issue of stick drift. And this can become a problem when you have one player who swears that the best way to play Halo 
is to turn your max input threshold all the way to the minimum. And then another player tries to copy that setting and outright disables their ability to peg to reach their max input threshold because the outer circumference of their thumbstick is tighter than it should be. The fact of the matter is, it's outright impossible to get Halo Infinite controlling like the MCC regardless of what settings you choose. In all honesty, the options given to us as players are honestly not that robust and not very customizable. And that's a bad thing because now that Halo Infinite has fully embraced crossplay, controller users need every bit of flexibility they can get to compete with KBM. I've gotten a few controller users who argue that because KBM can turn around so quickly, the inputs are balanced. And while these players are incorrect to take their frustrations out on KBM players, they are correct in pointing out that the game is bottlenecking them. That you have to physically wait to turn around and you can't do anything until acceleration kicks in. And this is really puzzling because now that controller users are expected to compete with keyboard and mouse users, they need that Halo 3 max sensitivity, that scale, now more than ever. I'm going to make another comparison to Destiny 2 here, because I think that Destiny 2 is a game that balances the inputs very well. Bungie even went so far as to remove a mod from the game and make it universal because all it did was hold controller users back. And what do you know, Destiny 2's max sensitivity is 720 degrees per second, twice that of Halo Infinite. While this game is cross-platform viable, it's definitely not cross-platform optimal. The fact of the matter is, both input methods, but most exclusively controller, need to change in order for everybody to have a better experience. Right now, both input methods feel kinda bad. If you like the way Halo Infinite feels on controller right now, then I don't want to take anything away from you, but this entire video has been leading up to a couple of requests for 343 Industries. Firstly, I want to see numerous options for tweaking the response curve in Halo Infinite. Those who like the game as it is now should be able to leave things as is, but for the rest of us we should have the option to make Halo Infinite feel like any of the previous games, alongside completely new options, kinda like how Call of Duty Warzone allows you to choose from multiple response curves. Next, I want to be able to choose a higher maximum rotation speed that doesn't change the baseline response curve. And lastly, I want more acceleration options, including an option for instantaneous acceleration, so that when you hit your max input threshold, there's no delay, you just instantly go to your maximum rotation speed. Now that Halo Infinite is fully committed to cross-platform play, we need more expansive and comprehensive controller settings. Controller users need to have more control over their reticle, where it goes, how it gets there, and how quickly it gets there. 343, you want Halo Infinite to handle like a modern shooter? Well, the industry standard is that gamepads are getting faster to keep up with mouse and keyboard. Halo Infinite represents a regression in the series because it makes gamepad users slower, not faster. Okay, so this video is taking and running way longer than I initially wanted it to. So before I go, I want to give you some pointers using the current state of Halo Infinite and knowing what I know about controller settings to give you a couple of pointers that you can utilize right now. I did something similar in a previous video, but I based a lot of those conclusions on knowledge that was kind of incorrect, and while my conclusions did have merit, I want to update them so that they are now more accurate. Okay, so pretty much every shooter game on the market with a controller has this mechanic that as you move your thumbstick forward, you will move very slowly, and as you move your thumbstick faster, you gain speed, and you hit your maximum speed when you hit the edge of your thumbstick. Having a high max input threshold on your move stick basically reduces the distance you need to move your thumbstick before you hit your maximum strafe speed. So if you have a high max input threshold, you're going to hit your maximum movement speed sooner and earlier. Okay, so when it comes to axial dead zones, most players are used to having their axial dead zones and most other shooters being relatively minimal, and there's a reason for that. Once you are successfully able to move your thumbstick, absolute left, right, up, or down, having a larger axial dead zone kind of makes things seem sluggish because it's unnecessary. So when it comes to axial dead zones, you kind of just want to have the minimum value necessary that you are able to move absolute left, right, up, down, north, south, east, or west. Basically, lower them as fully as possible, move straight, and if you notice that your character is deviating a little bit, that it's kind of shifting like this, low, increase the axial dead zone. 
Okay, when it comes to acceleration, I want to advise you to rock the highest setting possible. If it were possible to have 10 acceleration or instant acceleration like I want, then I would use that setting. But let me demonstrate to you what acceleration actually means. So this is the minimum value of acceleration. Do you see that as I move my thumbstick immediately to the edge, I kind of take a little bit before I reach my maximum sensitivity? All acceleration does is determine how quickly you reach your max sensitivity. It doesn't matter on thumbstick placement. So I have max input thresholds right on that right now. And I'm just going to slowly let my thumbstick slide toward the center. And as I do that, you'll notice there's no change on my rotation speed. Now, once I've moved past my max input threshold, do I start to slow down? Do you see how it's kind of instantaneous? This is because acceleration, once you hit your max input threshold, is irrelevant. It, your thumbstick is irrelevant. Basically, once you hit your max input threshold, the only thing that matters is the time that you spend past that max input. Next, understand that 10 sensitivity is only twice as fast as one sensitivity. Also understand that every sensitivity past five has the same max turn speed. Once you go below five, you start to lower your maximum turn speed. Change this to this. Finally, I want to discuss the Xbox Elite controller's ability to modify sensitivity curves. I want to explain why it's kind of misleading. So a lot of players look at this graph on the left, and they think that this is the adjustment that's being applied to the game, that they are actually modifying the response curve of the game. That's actually not accurate. What's really happening is that if we look and direct our attention to the chart on the right here, as I move my thumbstick, you'll see that two different icons start to appear. One of them is the actual position of my thumbstick. The other is a modification. It's basically a way of disguising your input. Basically, what this setting that I have enabled right now, it allows me to accelerate the output of the thumbstick without actually changing the response curve in game. So I'm just changing the output of my controller. I'm not actually increasing the variance of the response curve in the game. If I set this aggressive setting to the maximum, I'm still subject to the parameters of Halo Infinite slow turn. I won't actually change the scale of the response curve. I'll just change how quickly I accelerate along it. Okay, now this video is coming up on almost 30 minutes, and thank the Forerunners, that's all I've got for you today. If you've made it this far in the video, I want to sincerely thank you for your attention. I severely underestimated the amount of time and effort this video required, but now that the channel has taken off, thanks a lot to you guys, I want to increase the density of content going forward. Expect more frequent videos from here on out, and so if you haven't subscribed already, this is the part where I'm going to ask you to do that. The first link in the description down below will be to the sensitivity curves I use in this video. Also, you'll be able to find some data for other first person shooters like Doom, Destiny, and a bunch of other games. My Twitter is down there as well, and the support from you guys has been amazing. I'm coming up on 50 followers, and I hope to reach that goal with this video. Now, I know a lot of you were expecting a video on mouse and keyboard, and this was pretty much exclusively controller again, but Again, I underestimated the amount of time and effort this video would take. I thought I could do it in just one day, but it turned out to be a whole bunch of research, editing, quality of life issues and stuff. But the next video is going to be about reticles and bullet magnetism, and part four in this series, the final part, will be more of a concluding thoughts episode. Until then, if you'd like, share, comment, and subscribe, I'd very much appreciate it. And until next time, thank you so much. I understand this was a long wait for a long video, and going forward, I want to upload much more regularly with videos that have a much more manageable watch time. It's time to formally settle into the YouTube rhythm.